the next generation inspiring and educating because none of us will be here forever and none of us can do this work alone. And Dr. Tunnell was the kind of person that there was no one, no one that would have a bad word to say about the granddad. Everyone loved him. Everyone respected him. Everyone knew how hard he worked. Everyone knew what an honest, ethical man he was. And I really valued that. And uh, I really valued when he'd give me a compliment and he'd say that my major professor from my master's, Dr. Cheney, who passed along, he'd say, Dr. Cheney would have been proud of you for this. That meant a lot to me when your dad said that to me. And so that's why I try to pass along to you that I know your dad would be proud of you for the things you're doing, Chase. You know, you're just incredible work you're doing. You're, you've got big footsteps to follow in, but you're doing a fantastic job at it. Thank you. Well, and I, I want to mention here too, uh, the Sammies. So your work and being recognized and that people can actually go and they can vote uh, for you to win the Sammies. And so, uh, is there a website or something people can go to? There's the there's a website uh, and, and a page that they can go to vote. And it's a, what's open now is the People's Choice Awards, which uh, enables daily voting. Everybody can vote daily. And uh, we will have on our Facebook page the, oh, excuse me, sorry, Padre Island. I don't see mine. There's one. Uh, Padre Island NS Division of Sea Turtle Science and Recovery will post the page that has a link for people to vote. It's quite easy. It's down to the top five now for the People's Choice Award. Dr. Fauci, myself. Some big names in there. <laughs> absolutely. We're the only single ones, and the other three uh, that are in the top five are teams of people oh, okay. with uh, initiatives. And so they've got a big following because you know, all the friends were different individuals and involved in that so anyway it's the i'm so honored and grateful and and uh thank you for mentioning that and, and we'll have that link up to me it's i'm honored to to, to be named for this as a finalist but it represents the collective efforts of everyone it really did take a village it took a lot of people in the organizations over a long period of time to get us where we are with this uh and and I'm so grateful for all that help. And we're hoping that we can bring one in for South Texas conservation, sea turtle conservation, inspiring the next generation here. But even being in the top five is remarkable because I'm the first National Park Service employee to be a finalist since 2008. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's very rare. Well, congratulations. Thank that you. That is so great. Great for the area. And uh, thanks for your leadership and, uh, I mean, making all this happen. So. Well, and the idea behind the, the Sammies is actually, it's, it's a really great one because we know that over time, you know, again, none of us are going to be here forever. We've got to have good people going into positions in the future. And they want to show people that have had uh, successful careers in the federal government that found fulfillment and then they gave back to the American public and really wanted to do a good job for the American public to help inspire those from the next generation to go into federal service and pick up that torch and carry things along. And we're going to need good people to go into federal service. So I'm very supportive of that message. I think it's important. Yeah, yeah. That's excellent. Okay, let me go down here. Oh, we got to talk about the Nurdle Project, too. I saw Nurdle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got Nurdles here. Nurdles and turtles. Uh, this, this uh, for those that don't know, this uh, little plastic pellet is what we call a Nurdle. And it's um, there's two different types of plastic pellets that we usually find. Um, the ones that float is polyethylene or polypropylene. And these little pellets um, is the raw material to everything plastic. So you see these other bits of plastic that are down here. These are broken up pieces of bottles and things that were actually products. But when you find these pellets, here's another one. These pellets are actually, uh, have never been made into a product yet. They were lost uh, somewhere along the way, either at the plastic manufacturing site 
or they were lost uh, on a rail car or uh, dropped off in the ocean or something like that before it made it to its final destination of being melted down, put color to it, and made into a final product. So uh, we have this citizen science project called Nurdle Patrol where people go out for 10 minutes and they look at the high tide line and they, they count how many pellets they find in 10 minutes. Then they go to nurdlepatrol.org and they put how many pellets they found in there and it shows up on a map. And then that map they are able to uh, print up digitally or hard copy and then they can take it to the regulatory agencies um, and say, look, this is the problem in our area and we want to do something about it. But not only that, uh, those concentrations within that 10 minutes, uh, you know, of the pellets they find, tells us information about where these pellets might be coming from so that we can uh, try to stop it from happening. And so if y'all want to get involved in that, go to nerdlepatrol.org. Uh, there's a, a little video, four minute video there that'll show you how to do a patrol and how to put your data in and all that. Or you can just go to the website and check out the map and see what other people have found or, and see if anybody in your area has found any. And Jace, there's organizations all over the world now that are participating in this. That's right. Um, yeah, <laughs> and we've, we just had a new partnership with the Great Nurdle Hunt and they do something very similar uh, in, uh, around the world collecting these pellets. Uh, we try to focus our efforts, although we've had people in a bunch of different countries put data in, we try to focus our efforts in the United States because we think that that's where we can make the biggest sure. impact. Um, well, it was very interesting to see the data and the, where the largest concentrations were and, and how that related to where the manufacturing areas are. And that's important to inform managers and to inform those plants too. Uh, perhaps some don't know how many are getting loose. And um, how it, it, it's so much better to stop it at the source rather than trying to pick it up off the beach. Exactly. Yeah, you, yeah. Uh, picking it up off the beach uh, is not solving the problem. So you're Correct. exactly right. And who wants to eat a fish that's eating a bunch of nurdles? Ooh. That's not good. And more and more research over time as it comes out um, talks about the effects of those plastics getting into the bloodstream and, and possibly being passed along. It's, well, it's and I know your work and the work with uh, Dr. Pamela Plotkin and Tony Amos back in the late 1980s looking at the gut contents of sea turtles. We know that sea turtles are eating these pellets as well. Yes. And so, as, along with a lot of other plastics. So... Um. It's unfortunate, especially the little hatchlings. What what we found through our research, and, and I love that work. I wish I could do that now full time instead of some of the other things I do. <laughs> but it, it is fascinating to uh, when you look at the the turtles on a, a broad scale of different species and different sizes. What we see is the little ones. These these the little post hatchlings have the largest consumption, and that makes sense because they're when they swim out, they're swimming very vigorously until they get into the drift lines of sargasm or debris where uh, things are concentrated. So these pieces of plastic are going to be concentrated in these drift lines when they're eating their tiny pieces of shrimp and crab and sargasm. They're also going to be picking up these plastics. And that is, that's really not good. And who knows how many, probably millions of hatchlings die and just sink to the ocean never to be found because they succumb due to that. All right, so we don't even know the full scale of the problem. Probably not for that. The, the larger ones, we have a better chance of them washing ashore, stranded, but the, the little hatchlings, unless they die really close, you're yeah. not going to see them. Right. Well, and the unfortunate thing is you can see, you know, these pellets, uh, when they're in the sun, the UV light turns them an orangey color. And so, Right here I have a sargasm bulb next to one of these and if the sun gets to these over the years, these like the white pellet, uh, it will look just like, just like it, you can't tell. And yeah. so oh, organisms boy. are eating these things. Boy, and so, what a threat. That's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. That just makes me so sad. Well, the, what your organization and mine with the National Park Service, what we stress is public education. It is just critical. We, we all need to live on this earth together. 
uh, the wildlife and the people, and we can do so uh, in a more healthy, safe, harmonious manner through education. And if we educate people to not discard their trash, don't put your don't put your cup in the truck bed. Yeah, your magic cup <laughs> is going to fly out down the road onto the ground and and could end up in the ocean. That's right. Um, and, we and all know that you've got a great video that shows at that. At 55 miles an hour, apparently <laughs> that's when all the cups fly out. <laughs> well, but it's a practice that's heavily used, and we can easily avoid that. That's just something small. And I wanted to tell you, I, I told Texas State Aquarium yesterday, I was thinking the other day, uh, you know, as you get to, you're still far away from that, but <laughs> in my career, as you realize you've got uh, fewer years ahead than behind, uh, some educational efforts that might inspire some of the young ones, I want to start a program where people can become a Ridley Ranger, just like my little dog Ridley, who wanted to help the Kemp's Ridley turtles. The Ridley was trained to help find the nests that were really difficult to locate, and he was the first dog that successfully did that. Unfortunately, he passed on, he was a little care terrier like Toto. Unfortunately, he passed on a couple of years ago, but he loved to help. He would sit there when he found a nest and he would watch. This little care terrier, you know, they love to run around and do things they don't like to listen. He'd watch as I placed every egg into the box for protective care. And when I released hatchlings, he'd run behind and scare the galls off. <laughs> or if it was at night, he'd scare the crabs off. He, he had watched me weigh and measure hatchlings. He'd been around the hatchlings. The perfect assistant. He was the perfect <laughs> assistant. Know? He really did care. And uh, he was a nurturing little boy. And so I thought, let's start this program where we can inspire the kids to become a Ridley Ranger and you pick up your trash. You tell your parents, hey, don't put the magic cup in the truck bed, put it in a bag, take it to the trash can. Uh, and you do other things. Uh, you drive responsibly on, on the beach. If you're driving on the beach, don't uh, watch the, the speed limit. Watch carefully for nesting turtles during the nesting season. Report any nesting or stranded turtles you see. And, and uh, even adults could be a bit great. Yeah. It just make it a difference. Mm -hmm. So we'll think about maybe that in next year of everybody up here in this area working together. Yeah. Maybe it'll spread too. You're the one who knows how to spread this. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, I mean, that sounds like an awesome program. I'm, I'm ready to well, sign up. I, well, <laughs> I, I, I need somebody to help me get it, get it going. I'm a, I'm a sea turtle biologist who, who has had to become social media and everything. And during the COVID, we've all had to be jacks of all trades. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and we're learning, but again, it's collaboration, education, inspiration, getting that next generation involved. And I think hearing that story about Ridley would would be a good hook oh, for yeah. them to, to say, yeah, I want to be a Ridley Ranger too. Yeah, absolutely. That was his that was his registered name. Ridley. A Ridley Ranger. <laughs> yep. Because when we got him, that was my goal was to help find the nests that were difficult to locate. Because you, you know, you look oh, for nests. Oh, it yeah. can be incredibly difficult. It takes a skill to be able to find them and experience them. Absolutely. And sometimes, despite hours of looking, we can't do it. And his first nest, I was 17 miles down the beach. <laughs> and uh, Linda Reed, uh, whose family roots go way, way back on this island, and we hope to have her be a guest star too. She was one of the turtle patrollers, and she called on the radio to dispatch, saying, bring Ridley in, bring Ridley in. Well, he'd been trained, but he never had been given a nest to find that we didn't know where it was. Yeah. And I mean, my, what husband, a huge, my husband, that's great. Yeah, my husband brought him in. Nobody was there. And within minutes, he called to the lab and said, what do you want me to do with these eggs? Because Ridley found them. And he was so proud. And... Uh, it was really incredible. Uh, they used to say, find the nest for mama. You know, it sounds kind of corny for a PhD biologist, but I do think that that dog was doing a job for me. And he yeah. knew it made me happy. Yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, and so. Your dog is uh, was way better trained than, uh, than mine. <laughs> well. <laughs> we I, love our doggy. <laughs> well, you know, ter well, carriers are very uh, stubborn. And so he didn't listen a lot of the time. 
Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. You've got to keep a cherry around. We only remember the good parts, though. you got to well, no, but he wanted to help with the journals. Mm. He listened then. Yeah. But at home, like, you know, he'd see whether he wanted to do it or not. Yeah. <laughs> his sister. And, and he tricked his little sister, too. He's, uh, <laughs> he's very smart. He, he liked to eat. In fact, there's a good story about it. When we wanted to get, I wanted to get a dog to help find a nest, and my husband was researching breeds, and he came across the Care Interior, and he found that there was a family that had some Care Interior pups in Turtle Cove, of all places. And there were four little pups around the food bowl, and one tail was wagging. That was Ridley's. So I know, look at that. And then one of the four liked to go out in the yard and sniff around with the females while the others just kind of lay flat. That was Ridley. So that's how we picked Ridley. Wow. And uh, so it was like it was meant to be for Turtle right. Cove. And <laughs> uh, it was really remarkable. And he, he, I would even have video of him when I'd say turtle and he'd see uh, on TV there'd be a turtle and he'd stand up on his rear legs and he'd go, oh, he, he loved the turtles. <laughs> So, well, Parker wants to be a veterinarian. Veterinarian, so. that's awesome. <clears throat> well, she loves animals. Well, just keep studying hard, and <laughs> the sky's the limit. You've got a great family to support you, that, that believe in education, and uh, believe in giving back, and trying to help others. So you're you're very fortunate, and of course, there's every, lots of people love you because they love your dad and they love your grand your grandfather. So that, that's a wonderful thing too. And we sure appreciate your help on those social media videos. What grade are you? What grade? What grade And Cynthia. The lady behind the camera. <laughs> I got Facebook Live. It's really yeah. How the operation is done here. This is actually a, a Facebook Live. If y'all have any questions, put them in the comments. Cynthia and Dr. Shaver will be there to answer them. Whatever questions you have. It's still early. We've got a lot of years to discover that. It's like a, a canvas that can anything can be painted on. So much potential. Well, I, I also wanted to talk about the, uh, the sad finding that Alicia reported to me of that predated nest yesterday Ooh. on San Jose yeah. Island. It was at one of those sites where tracks were found and they couldn't locate the nest. Yeah. And that just, again, demonstrates, as, as we have so many times, that nests left unprotected on these Texas beaches right now just do not stand much of a chance. Uh, but it, it's important she documented it. 
and uh, well that happened but, last year too uh, yeah. we were uh, we didn't find out until a day later and uh, it just takes you know one one evening and the coyotes come in or like this last week we had a uh, tropical storm Cristobal which brought water all the way up to the dunes and uh, some of these turtles are nesting just right above the high tide line right they and, won't stand a chance right exactly so the work that y'all are doing is so important well we had dr Tussaud with us earlier this week and he said that beaches now are an engineered system they're not natural as they were before you've got jetties you've got the, uh, sand mining and dredging and and areas that are starved for sand, areas that, that have a higher accumulation, and and so we uh, we have to take these to say the critically endangered capsule turtle. We've used practices that Cynthia learned down in Mexico, um, and Cynthia worked there, got her training down at Rancho Nuevo for several years. I've seen some of those pictures. Yeah. <laughs> The, the corral, the, the same techniques that helped save the species from extinction where for decades they put virtually every clutch into a protected corral and the numbers increased uh, rapidly wow. and so we know it would, had been successful to help save them then and so we're, we're using uh, that and then our facility as well and the survival strategy for Kemp's Ridley is called predator swamping the Kemp's Ridley tends to nest in uh, synchronous aggregations called arabadas, where the turtles come in at one time. And then the thought is the eggs hatch at pretty much the same time, and there's so many hatchlings going into the water that the predators couldn't possibly eat them all. The Kemp's Ridley hatchlings are slower than the loggerheads and greens, but you can be slower if there's thousands of you. You just have to be the one that makes it in successfully. But here in Texas, we don't have enough numbers to swamp the predators by a long shot. Just like you said, the coyotes will come in within 24 hours. And then the nuisance coastal flooding that Dr. Tussaud talked about earlier this week, which has increased in prevalence. So with this critically endangered species, we, we take these protective measures and it's authorized under our permits and agreed upon by uh, the authorities in Texas and with the Kemp's Ridley Working Group. And they've been successful and we're so excited that our num we know that our numbers of nests have been going up. But we wanted to see were the hatchlings that we were releasing coming back to nest. People would ask that all the time. Well, we don't tag the little ones. There's no known way to tag this tiny, fragile yeah. turtle. So we have had a program, Turtle CSI, uh, <laughs> for many years where we tried to nest, match the nests of unknown maternity. So we don't know mom, we just found a nest, and then the nest where, where uh, uh, um, well, I'm the nest of unknown maternity to the nesting turtles that we've seen. So we take a small tissue sample from the females, uh, samples from the dead embryos, send them off to the genetics lab, and we've done this for decades, and then they match them. And they've been pretty successful with that. But this year, we said, well, let's go and find the second generation. Let's see if we can prove that some of these turtles are coming back from those that we were releasing. And indeed, at the Southeast Regional Sea Turtle Network meeting, we showed the data. They had just been uh, found for the first time that hatchlings we released 12 to 16 years ago are indeed coming back to nest here. Wow. So that's, that's really amazing. exciting. Yeah, that is great. But I also want to say, Jace, that the cooperation is critical because what I found through my satellite tracking is that these females move a lot in between clutches. They lay on an average two and a half to three times during the nesting season. Obviously, you can't lay a half a clutch, so that's the average over everybody. <laughs> but um, they move around because there's a lot of sharks out there. You just can't sit there waiting. So what I believe is that when the conditions are right for nesting, if they're not necessarily right back here where they made their clutch before, they may nest on Mustang Island. Uh -huh. In your pulse where you had of three turtles that nested this week, yeah. one had previously nested on San Jose, 
Ah. And two had nested previously at Potter Isle National Seashore. Ah. <laughs> so I jokingly say traitors. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but the the truth is it's critical we collaborate because what if the turtles weren't protected there? We could do everything we want to yeah. protect them here, but if they occasionally go nest up there and they're in danger, then right. our efforts are not going to be nearly as effective. So yeah. Yeah. I wanted to pass that along. I didn't have a chance to tell Alicia. So. Yeah, no, that's great. That's yeah. awesome. All three of them were had nested nested there at Mustang this year. Wow. Yeah. That's but the conditions were right. Yeah. That front was that very unusual June cold front was coming through. I had everybody on high alert. Hey, I think there's going to be nesting. There's been so many uh, people on the beach, uh, at least on the weekends. Yes. Um, I'm surprised any turtles are coming up, but they find a way. They do find a way. Some are more tolerant than others. And, and for those of you uh, just tuning in, the temps really nest mostly during the day. People that are used to other sea turtle species, those nest mostly at night. So the temps really has the additional challenge uh, of, uh, yeah, they're going to come up and try to share the beach during the, when the public is there in the nesting season. But um, that's why public education is so critical, so that we get their assistance. And what we do see is, is some more tolerant than others, some very skittish, and it's important that we teach people to not rush up to the nesting turtles when they see them, report the nest to us immediately because they're really hard to find. And then some are, the shy ones seem to be, uh, we've got this, this big congregation on San Jose this year that I think are probably those that are just wanting to get away from it all. Yeah, yeah, record year on San Jose yes, this year. Yes, wow. but the, the beaches have been so crowded since COVID, people just want to get out in the fresh air. Yeah. And uh, Mustang and, and us all the way down to about the... At least the five mile mark has just been packed. Even during weekdays sometimes. That's wild. Yeah, I'd be called by some reporters and say, well, are the turtles doing any better this year because the people aren't out on the beach? And I'd laugh at them. They're out on the beach here. Right. <laughs> then we've got that captain come over here to get the volatile of see you over here now as a reminder if you all have any questions uh, feel free to uh, ask any questions uh, dr. Donna Shaver and Cynthia are going to be uh, on the line and they're be able to answer any questions you got in the comments section
water comes up, they get their first taste of salt water and head back to the ocean. As the sun is coming up, Okay, so uh, we're wrapping it up here. Uh, if y'all have any questions, like I said, uh, Dr. Donna Shaver uh, is going to be on the line, as well as Cynthia Rubio to answer any questions you got. And with that, uh, we'll see y'all later.